Hello and welcome to the Business of Story. I'm your host, Park Howell, and I am so proud to welcome Sendable as our sponsor. Sendable is the social media management platform that I personally prefer to handle all of our storytelling online. Sendable has generously offered you, an ardent Business of Story listener, an incredible 30% discount on their traction plan. It's normally $99 a month, but if you use my link, you can get it for just $69 a month. So visit sendable.com forward slash park 30 to start your free 30-day trial today. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. Well, hello there, friend. Thanks for coming back to the business of story. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'm Park Howell, and I'm so glad you're here. Now, today we've got an extra value-packed show for you, which explains why it went a little bit longer than most of our shows do here. But I could have spoken with our guest for at least another two hours. Believe me, every minute is worth your time. With us today is Jude Charles, a young and gifted story-driven filmmaker, brand strategist, and speaker. For nearly 15 years, Jude has crafted documentary-like origin stories and demonstration stories for world-class brands such as Google, Coldwell Banker, and even celebrity Steve Harvey, just to name a few. Through his dramatic demonstration of proof process, Jude helps purpose-driven entrepreneurs just like you bring their story to life through documentaries and videos. Like I did, you will learn a ton from Jude on how he roadmaps a story project, the unique way in which he demonstrates a product offering, and he'll show you what he calls the brand's unique mechanism. So let's get started with Jude Charles right now on this edition of The Business of Story. All the way from Pompano Beach, Florida, Jude Charles, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Park. It's a pleasure and an honor to be on the show. Oh, well, I appreciate that. I think that you were referred over to our good friends over at Turnkey Podcasting. Is that right? That is right. Yeah, Doug and I are friends, and he recommended that I be on the Business Story podcast, especially after seeing some of the work that I've been doing and knowing that we're in the same field of storytelling. Yeah, Doug and the group over there at Turnkey really do great work. They handle the business of story. So while we record this, just for you all out there, I want to give them a shout out. They have been a partner of ours now for a couple of years. And I record the show, send everything to them, and then they work their magic and get us up and running. But what I really love about Doug and the guys over at Turnkey is how they are so open with their ideas on how to build a podcast, whether you've started one or you've got one, they have really terrific insight in how to use it for branding, marketing, and so forth. And I didn't actually mean for this to turn into a big pitch for them, but I'm so glad that they have connected you and I today for the show. I am too. I am too. They are a great, great group of people there. I got to tell you, I'm lucky because I get a ton of requests to be on the show. And I get, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people that are showing up as quote unquote storytelling gurus and experts and whatever. And when I go through their work, unfortunately, I see, well, they're not really. They're 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 talking story, they're talking about story, but they're not actually really using it. So I hate to say I've gotten a little bit jaded, but I do, you know, when these requests come in, I wonder, okay, another storyteller, what are they really up to? Yours came in and, you know, again, you came through the threshold of Doug. So that was number one saying, ah, he's not going to send me anyone and that's not going to be powerful. But when I went on your site and then you and I had a chance to chat a month or so ago, I was really impressed with what you have brought 
and created around telling stories using video and your whole approach to it. So I'm excited to share this idea, your concept of the dramatic demonstration of proof with our listeners and how they can use it immediately to start becoming more compelling in their own storytelling. So Jude, give us your backstory. How do you find yourself here today in doing the good work you're doing in video storytelling? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Park, as an eight-year-old child, I wasn't a normal kid. I wasn't outside playing basketball or football. I, uh, I wasn't inside even playing video games. Instead, did I... Did you grow up in Florida? I did grow up in Florida. Yeah. In Pompano Beach, Florida. And, you know, instead, I was the kid that locked myself in a room and I just wrote all day. And what ultimately ended up happening was that I would end up as an eight-year-old kid writing 100-page books about what I thought my future life would look like. So, so was it about you or were you ever doing any sort of fiction stuff and creating characters and that kind of thing? It was about me, but it was a bit fiction as well because I, I wanted to know what would, I wanted to envision what the next 20 years of my life would look like. So one of the books I wrote was like The Police Life of Jude Charles because growing up I actually wanted to be a police officer. <laughs> Um, That's awesome. And yeah. you were eight years old when eight you were old. already envisioning a future for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and really what it was, it was just a love for storytelling. I'm not sure that I really understood what storytelling was at that time, other than just being able to dream, being able to envision what life could look like. Of course, I, I didn't end up becoming a police officer. I didn't end up, uh, I wrote a book about uh, being a baseball player and I didn't end up doing that either. But well, were you surrounded by storytellers at this time? Like your mom, parents, grandparents, friends, family? I mean, what do you think ignited this in you as an eight-year-old? I think it was curiosity. So I am the youngest of 10 children in the house that we wow, grew up in. Wow, 10. Yeah, in the house that we grew up in, it was six of us all here at one time. And I think it was just curiosity. The difference between you know me and the brother that comes before me is seven years, so I grew up really fast. And... I think it was curiosity and wisdom and just looking at, okay, well, this is what my brothers and sisters have, or this is what my parents have. What, what will I have? I think that's what it was. It was just curiosity of what the future could look like. Do you think you were trying to carve out your own personal brand? So you stood out, you know, in this group of 10 kids, you know, nine siblings. And I, and I can relate to that because although we didn't have 10, I grew up in a family of seven. And you, I know that we all sort of carve out what our own personal brand is in there unintentionally, intuitively, we do this. Did you feel like that, that was at play with you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think when there's such a large family, you, it's easy. And at that point, my mother had had me when she was 40 and my father was 48. So and by that point, they're a bit older and, and I hate to say it, tired. And so you do try to find your <laughs> identity yeah. in that and try to find your, where do you fit in? And what are you going to do based off of how you fit in? And so, yeah, for sure. I think it was building my own personal brand and looking at who is Jude Charles? So then what happened? So then I continued writing all throughout elementary school, middle school, and I got into high school and I took a TV production class and I knew because I had kind of played around with cameras in middle school, I knew I wanted to get into the broadcasting field. Um, so I, I took a TV production class uh, in my junior year of high school. And I remember there was a question that my teacher asked me, she sent, she, in the beginning of the year, she gives out a survey and on this survey, it asks is, do you want to, you know, what do you see yourself doing in college? And that was one thing that I wrote. I wanted to major in broadcasting, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to be in front of the camera or behind the camera. And I don't know if I was the only kid that said this, but that year, my teacher, Mrs. Donnelly took a liking to me and she taught me everything that she knew about video production, everything that she had known about TV production. And, and so every single day, like I would, the class would get a lesson, but then I'd get a special lesson as to something a little bit more advanced. And by the end of that junior year, I was 17 years old. You know, she once again called me up to the front of the room and handed me a yellow envelope. And, you know, I was like, well, what is this? And she said, well, here's your first set of business cards. And she had told me the day before, part of the story that I leave out is that the day before she told me that you should start a business. You're really good at this. And I didn't say yes. I didn't say no, because I hadn't, I didn't have any entrepreneurs in my family. I didn't know what it meant to be an entrepreneur, run a business, especially at 17. 
but she didn't give me an opportunity to say no. She handed me my first set of business cards and I've been running the business ever since. So ever since you didn't, you didn't go on to school, you know, higher ed than that, you basically had already gotten yourself prepared starting as a storyteller as an eight-year-old, you know, creating those imagined realities for yourself and then learning this and you just launched right into your business? Yes, yeah, so I launched the business at 17 while well, it was May 5th, 2006, but I did do one year of college because as you can imagine, as the last of 10, especially the only one that may not go to college, I decided to go try it for one year. And as I was building the business, I got a big opportunity to work with the city that I live in, city of Pompano Beach. They were celebrating 100 years and I won the bid to do the 100 year documentary and it required for me to spend a year documenting different people that had come through the city. And so I did it for a year and, and, and I told myself, you know what, I'll come back to college. I'll take a year off. I'll come back. And I didn't end up going back. So yeah, I did not complete college, but I decided that I would run the business full time from there. Well, of course, this begs the question then. So of your nine siblings that preceded you, they all went to school and you were the one college and you were the one that said, no, I'm going to start this video production business. What kind of pushback did you get on that? Oh, I continue to get pushback for years. I, the pushback was that, you know, is this really something that you could do that makes a living or is this just a hobby? And of course, because we, had, we were all raised, hey, you go to school, get an education, get a great job. That was the pushback. It was just, you need to go to college. Like I get it. You're kind of talented in this. You may be making a little bit of money here, but you need to go to college to really secure yourself, to really do something that will um, make you good money. And so for years, even, even after I started making good money, I was still getting the question of, where are you going back to school? <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, you know, is this like, I get it. You're making, again, you're making some money, but you need to go back to school. Like you, you got to have a degree. But yeah, I just decided that I would take my own route. I'll take the road, less travel. So you launched your business May 5th, 2006, and somehow you landed this big, big project for Pompano Beach. So that must have been pretty impressive. I'm curious, what do you think they saw in you as a very young man starting out your video company that said, yeah, we will entrust our 100-year video in you? That is a great question that I don't know I ever asked. I think what they saw in me, well, the first thing is obviously I was born and raised here. And so I had the advantage of, you know, just, just wanting to know the history. And I think that was something that I put in my bid is that, you know, this is where I was born and raised, but I know nothing about the city. A hundred years and I don't, I don't know that much. And so I think it was, again, part of it going back to what started it for me as an eight-year-old child, just truly allowing my curiosity to be front and center. And being able to tell them that, being able to tell them, hey, yes, I get it. I'm 19 years old. I am young, but this is what I want to do because I'm passionate about it. And I'm really interested in knowing about the history of this city and the stories, the rich stories that come from this city. So I think I led with curiosity. I think I led with wanting to tell stories. So you've been around now, your company, for what, about 13, 14 years? Yes. And has it always been great growth for you? Not at all. You know, although I won that big contract in 2008 with the city of Pompano Beach, the first five years for me were absolutely brutal because I went into this, like I mentioned before, that I had a great talent, but it, I didn't understand what it meant to be an entrepreneur, to do sales and marketing, to um, get paid what I thought I was worth. And so for the first five years, I struggled to make money. I struggled to get the right type of clients that would work with me. I struggled. I knew that I've always wanted to do documentaries, but I also, you know, dabbled into doing weddings and doing uh, birthday parties and doing church events because I was just trying to find a way to make good money. And so for the first five years, I struggled, absolutely struggled. And it wasn't until I was in my room sitting on the edge of my bed thinking about, okay, you know what, maybe my family is right. Maybe this was just, it was fun. I did it for five years, but maybe I should. I should give it up. I've had a good run. And in that moment, I get a phone call from a client that I had been working with for a year. And her name was Keisha Dior. And I remember looking at this phone and thinking, this may not be the right time to uh, talk to a client right now because I'm not in the right headspace. But for one reason or another, I end up, you know, picking up the phone. I'm like, hello. And she's, she's like, Jude, Jude, you won't believe it. You won't believe it. 
And I'm like, what, what happened, Keisha? And she's like, you know, I've been doing this business for 12 months. I just got off the phone with my accountant and we've crossed the $1 million mark. And what kind of business was she in? And so she was running a cosmetic business and we were doing a documentary. I had filmed, it's a three-part series documentary about her building this company from the ground up. And so it was cosmetics. If you think of uh, lipsticks like uh, blue or purple or green, these weren't cosmetics that were popular at the time back in 2010. Well, yeah, I went on your website and saw her story there. And wow, yeah, those lips really pop way back, <laughs> especially way back in the day with uh, the bright, bright, the almost fluorescent colors and the sparkle and the bling in it. It was pretty amazing. So right, had you right. done this documentary with her before you were having this dark night of the soul out sitting on your bed thinking, what do I do next? Yes, yes. So we had been working together at that point for a year. And she was paying me good money. But again, I couldn't rely on just one client. But what I realized was, in that moment of her giving, you know, giving me that call, what I realized is that there was something more that I was doing here that I needed to tap into. Because it was the first time it had happened. It was the first time I'd ever done a documentary of this nature. Of course, I did the City of Pompano Beach documentary, but it wasn't based off of an entrepreneur. And it wasn't about the city making money back from their project. It was really just about, you know, celebrating the 100-year anniversary. And so for me, it was really a transition moment. It was a, one of those defining moments in my life where I realized, okay, she just made a million dollars off of a piece of content that we created and she understood how to leverage it. Not only that, what was the stories that we were telling in the documentary that allowed people to build this deeper connection with her to the point that they're willing to try out these crazy colored lipsticks? For me, it made me realize, okay, I've got to go back and one, I've got to get out of my own way. I've got to realize, okay, there is a solution here. She knows how to do sales and marketing. I have the blueprint right in front of me. Let me just take a step back. I'll continue to work on this project, but let me take a step back and really learn sales and marketing so I can get back on the right path. So a couple of things strike me here. Starting off this show, you've used the word curiosity, I don't know, four or five, six times. So obviously that is a, a theme in your life, if not the overall dominant theme. And you mentioned that you were always really interested in documentary filmmaking. Your very first one was a documentary, but like so many people in business, you're trying to make ends meet. You're trying to prove to people that, you know, you've got a business model here. So you're taking other jobs, uh, wedding videos and those kinds of things that really aren't documentary. You're just capturing the moment. And honestly, not a whole lot of curiosity has to go into that particular type of production. So did you feel like, what you learned maybe in those first four or five years is that it's not about making the money, but about actually following your curiosities, your passion around curiosities, and then opening up this aha moment of, I need to focus solely on my approach to documentary storytelling on behalf of brands and clients and so forth. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, those first four or five years, I mentioned that they were brutal, they were a struggle, but I think it's ultimately what helped me get to that point where I was creating something that I loved with Keisha. It was being able to tap into, because when Keisha first approached me about doing this documentary, um, she actually wanted to do a vlog video series. So the traditional, uh, you know, follow her around with a camera. We may post it every other day, but I wasn't really interested in that because I didn't feel like there would be any kind of storytelling in that. Instead, what I pitched her was, hey, let's do a documentary. Hey, let's actually show, you know, you're starting this from scratch. Let's actually get into your mind and understand why are you doing this in a time when this isn't popular? You know, what's going into this? What's the bigger idea here? Because the bigger idea for her was about self-confidence. It was about women empowerment and being able to uh, believe in yourself and to be confident in your own skin. And so I pitched her that idea. And I think for sure those first four or five years just struggling and realizing, okay, I'm not doing the work I want to do. The only way I'm going to be able to do the work that I want to do is if I ask for it, is if I just say, hey, I don't want to do that, but what do you think about this idea instead? And luckily, through working with her, she believed in the idea. She may not have come to me with the idea originally, but she, came, she believed in it so much that she said, you know what, Jude, I'll give you a try and I'll pay you money for it. <laughs> and I'll pay you money for it. You know, I'm on her site right now. It looks like she's still just killing it out there. It's at, uh, and how do you say her last name? Kior? Kior. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so it's 
K-E-Y-S-H-I-A-K-A-O-I-R.com. <laughs> if the <laughs> listeners out there want to jump in and, and, and take a look at the, you know, the, the person you're working with in the product. So obviously that really launched her and it opened up your eyes, it sounds like. Oh yeah, absolutely. It launched her into a world that knew nothing about her. Um, and what it did again is it allowed her, we focused a lot on her story, why she was building the brand from the ground up. But what it also did for her is, is so that's actually one of three businesses that she now runs. Uh, so cosmetics was the first business. The second business was she got into fitness. And so she created a series of products for fitness. And then um, the third business is that she's now selling, I believe, wigs and hair extensions. And so, yeah, it's, it, it allowed people to get to know her, believe in her, that they were willing to follow her with whatever next adventure that she was willing to do. So all the work now that you do in video storytelling is all approached from this idea of curiosity and documentary, trying to capture the background and the struggle and the story of that particular person or brand? Yeah, absolutely. So it's about looking into who the entrepreneur is, what has led you to this moment you know, with every project that I do, I start with what's called a road mapping session. And in that road mapping session, I'm really digging deep to find out, okay, Park, I know you're a storytelling consultant and I know you're, you're coaching and consulting, but what has led you to this moment? And of course, because I've listened to the podcast and I know more about you, I know that you started in advertising. But getting a lot of that backstory was, is what helps me understand what do I need to capture to show who, who Park is now to show how he shows up to a consulting session, how he shows up to his workshops when he's doing workshops with clients. Um, because it's more about who you are than what you can do. The who, as, as often we hear people like to do business with people that they know, like, and trust, that is what I'm building, the know, like, and trust bridge to who you are so that people know who you are, like what you have to say, and then trust that you can provide the solutions to their needs. Now, most people go out and they just shoot their video and tell their story about here's who I am, a little bit about my background, but here's what I deliver, the outcomes and the experience people get. It sounds like your approach is more origin story heavy to really understand the why you do what you do. Why do you think that works for customers when they see that, when they get that sort of backstory on a prospect, on you know, person, their product or service? Why do you think that sort of documentary style works? You know, I think entrepreneurs, they're really good at telling you what they can do. And initially, when you meet someone, you're always curious about what that backstory is, right? You're curious about, even with this podcast, as you're interviewing me now, you're asking me, well, how did this even get started? I see your work. I see that it's great. But obviously, there's something that led to this moment. There's something that led to you being able to have this talent. And so, I think that origin story is so important, so critical to understanding who this person is, but allowing you to understand it so much that you connect with them. There's, there's these small connection points in our lives that makes us build the kind of friendships that we build, right? Small things like uh, in the beginning, we talked about I am the last of 10 and you came from a big family as well, right? That's a connecting point. We bring that up, we have that conversation and now that changes the kind of relationship that we have moving forward. And so I think the origin story is all about relationship building knowing where each other have come from so that we can walk together forward. Yeah, it reminds me of something that I think about often on this, you know, the power of story and what does it really do for us? Well, it conveys a truth and within that truth creates the trust and the relationship that you're looking for. Now, that truth could be Positive, it could be negative, but as long as it's truthful, your audience knows and feels that. And I guess really documentary style video storytelling is all about finding and sharing what is the truth of this offering. Yes, absolutely. Sharing the truth of, of not only what is you know, the truth of this offering, the truth of what is really happening when no one's looking. Uh, part of what I like to capture a lot of, and it's, it's easy to do when you're doing documentaries, is behind the scenes. And so what is really, really happening when no one is looking? If you and I, Park, go to a Starbucks and it's only me and you in the store, cashier, and someone leaves behind their wallet, right? The cashier may be in the back trying to get new products to put up front, but it's only me and you. Now, three things could happen in that moment. One, 
you know, we're getting ready to leave and I walk past it as if I haven't seen it. Two, I decide to pick up the wallet, take the money out and put it in my pocket. But the third thing that could happen is that I go out of my way to call the cashier in the back to turn in this wallet. In that moment, whether whatever I decide to do tells you a bit more about who I am and tells you, it gives you the truth of who I am because of what I'm willing to do when no one else is watching. It's just me and you. It's just me and you in there. The cashier's not there. The person who lost their wallet's not there. But it's just more about who, like, it's, 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 that is what shows you the truth of who a person is, is when no one's watching. Well, and Jeff Bezos of Amazon said it, I think, really well when he said your brand is about what people say about you when you're not in the room. So it's that brand ethos. And that's in the stories you tell, I guess, you're trying to build meaning around that brand or that person so that people have a sense of who they are and what they're about. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So what happened then? So you had, uh, you were there, you're struggling, you're thinking, I'm, nah, I, I don't want to do this. The phone rings. It's Keisha. She says, man, we just, you know, eclipsed the million dollar mark. Thanks for your work. Then what'd you do? Yeah, then I, I did two things. One, I decided to go to workshops and specifically workshops that talked about the business side of filmmaking. And I took online courses at the time. But the other thing that I did is I started looking at why was this project successful with Keisha Dior? Because I, of course, storytelling is a piece of it. But what else was there that caused people to love so much who she was and what she was doing that they were willing to hand over money for her products? And so that's where this dramatic demonstration of proof began to build because I wanted to look at, okay, I've done it once, but it might've been a fluke. Can I repeat this? Can I do this again? Um, And so I looked at, okay, what did I capture? What stories did we tell? The origin stories is definitely a part of it, but there's the why stories, right? right? Like I mentioned that her why was about more about confidence and standing in her own truth. And so I created these five core elements of dramatic demonstration of proof, which are behind the scenes, social proof, live illustration, transformation, and unique mechanism. And I'm sure we'll get into all five, but I wanted to be able to, okay, create this model that I can now take to different industries, which I ended up doing. So after work with, working with Keisha, I decided to take this to a watch repair man. And that was a new world for me. I didn't, I didn't understand anything about watch repairmen and how skilled they can be. But I decided to do this mini documentary of a watch repairman and showing why he was passionate about what he was doing. Um, And it's always tied to a business result. It's always because for him, it was about, he has a local storefront, but he wanted to be able to allow people to send him packages. Of course, when someone's sending you a package or sending you, they might be sending you an expensive watch. They have to know who you are. They have to trust that you can really do this and they're not just sending you a watch that they'll never get back. And so I continue to take this model that I had kind of created and refine it over and over to get to the point of where it is now, which is dramatic demonstration of proof. So do you feel like when you did that first documentary series for Keisha and it was successful that you were operating kind of as an intuitive storyteller? I mean, you had been doing this. You've obviously had been honing your skills since you were you know, an eight-year-old, basically, you had a teacher that took great interest in you and helped you build as, you know, your proficiency in video production. Did you follow a course or your roadmap or anything when you did that? Or in hindsight, did you go back and look at it and say, now, why did this work? And how can I be much more intentional about doing, you know, uh, copying this success in future uh, productions? Yeah, In the beginning, I've always been a student of storytelling, you know, looking at some of my favorite documentarians in the, and from the past, um, you know, Michael Moore and looking at the work that he had been doing. I've always been a student of that because I wanted to understand not only the hero's journey, which I knew at the time, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, but I want to understand how did this fit into a documentary model where you almost don't really know what's happening. So you have to craft this story from, from what, is truly happening in the moment. You have to craft that story and know what to take out, what to leave in. And so I've always been a, a student of that and I've always looked at, okay, how can this work in a different way? That was one of the reasons I've, I've come across um, Business of Story. I think I've mentioned this to you that I have been listening to Business of Story since you started the podcast, I believe in 2016. 
I, I appreciate that. You're, you're exactly right. You are show like 229 or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And so I've always looked at, I've, again, we started with curiosity. I didn't intentionally start with that, but that's where this conversation has led to. And it's always just having this student kind of mentality that I'm going to, I know I know storytelling, but how can I make it better? How can I do something different? How can I, um, one of the things I mentioned in dramatic demonstration of proof is transformation. How can I show a different kind of transformation that's happening here for this client? I recently wrapped up a six part documentary series with a woman by the name of Tracy Lynn. And in this documentary series, I show the transformation that she has from running a large company, running a uh, direct sales company. So they sell jewelry, but think of it like an Amway or Mary Kay um, where they have consultants. And so she has 35,000 consultants. She's running a very successful business. And now she's looking at how do I pivot my brand to something different? And so she's afraid. She's afraid of reinventing herself. She's afraid of, of, you know, messing up the one thing that she's gotten right in her business, which is this jewelry business, um, because now she wants to get into cosmetics. And so I show that transformation from part one to part six, especially in the moment where, you know, she's starting this new brand and the fulfillment center that houses all of her products that ships out all of her products to the different customers, to the different consultants, they, they go out of business. And so she ends up having $5 million worth of jewelry in this fulfillment center that she has to now move out in three days. And if she doesn't, she could lose her business. Now, we didn't anticipate that happening in the documentary. We didn't know any of this would happen. But that moment, being, being there and being able to see that, that moment allows you to see this transformation and, and allows you to see how she is able to thrive in a moment where she may lose it all. And so, yeah, I think always being a student of storytelling is what has helped to continue to shape this. For, you know, that has allowed me to continue to do this work is because I've never relied on the fact that, okay, I've done this, you know, a thousand times. No, how do I do it better? How do I take it to the next level? So you and your group, your crew just happened to be there when this was all going down, that serendipitous moment that, uh, that really brought uh, at least one part of your series to life because you're seeing it happen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, so we were preparing to film. A, she was getting ready to go on a cruise with some of her business partners. And it happened in that moment. It happened three days before she had to get on the cruise. And that's why it becomes a big moment, because now she, she's not even thinking about this cruise. She's thinking, I may lose it all. And we just happened to be there because we were documenting the entire thing. Um, we happened to be there for that specific moment. Amazing. Now you've done this for a lot of big brands and even celebrities. Google is on your list where you've gotten in and, and done some of this documentary type work for them. And, and uh, Steve Harvey, how did, how did you land those big whales for your growing company? So Steve Harvey is a great story, actually. I was able to get Steve Harvey through a mutual client that we have, um, Jeff Johnson. So the very first time of working with Jeff Johnson, the reason why this is a great story is because Jeff Johnson was a person that I, when I was making my transition from, okay, I understood sales and marketing, I decided to be bold and I knew that Jeff Johnson was thinking about working with me. Jeff Johnson, to give context, Jeff Johnson is located in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm located in Pompano Beach, Florida. And so I knew he had some kind of interest in wanting to work with me because he had seen my work, someone else had introduced us. But he hadn't pulled the trigger. And so what I had decided to do was that I would fly to Baltimore, Maryland on my own dime. I didn't let him know I was coming. And once I got to Baltimore, Maryland, I said, Jeff, I'm in town. Let's meet. And it was because of that meeting that, you know, we started to work together. But through Jeff Johnson, I was able to get introduced to Steve Harvey. And so I've been blessed that for the 13, 14 years, all the work that I've been able to do has been through referrals. But it always starts with taking that bold step forward to be able to say, this is what I want. And so I, I just have to go after what I want. Oh, well, it goes back to the eight-year-old you, imagining something for yourself in the future and what that might look like. And then the weird thing I've experienced about story is 
as woo-woo as it sounds, is it takes on a force all its own, doesn't it? It's like you get caught up in this story vortex if you start thinking about it and putting yourself in those kinds of positions. All of a sudden, that story takes off. I guess okay. it kind of goes back to that whole thing of be careful of what you wish for because oh, yeah, it absolutely. may come true, but a story is the ultimate wish-fulfilling mechanism, isn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, being able to envision – it may not happen exactly the way you think of it as happening, but if you can see it, if you can envision it in your mind and you focus on that, you focus on, okay, this is the way I saw the story. You focus on, okay, this is the moment where I need to, <laughs> the stakes have been risen and I need to now take action. Yeah, I think absolutely. It's, it's stories are so powerful in more ways than one. And that's, again, I come back to your podcast because I think What's magical about your podcast specifically, now I may be biased because I haven't even searched for another storytelling podcast, but I, th <laughs> I th appreciate think that. what you've been able to do here is that you really do look at, you know, all the different angles and degrees of storytelling. And I say degrees because I'm thinking of 360 degrees, but like there's, there's all these different angles of storytelling that honestly, I've never even thought of. Um, and, and what I mean by that is you can use stories for yourself internally, for your personal life, like I did as an eight-year-old kid, envisioning what life could look like. I could still do that at 30 years old, but you can also use it for your business and for your brand to be able to allow people to connect with you in a, in a much different way that, as, again, allows you to build the type of future that you want for your business. Absolutely. What was the project you did with Steve Harvey? What kind of piece did you create for him? Steve had launched a book called Act Like a Success, Think Like a Success. And it's about his journey through entrepreneurship. And so the project that I had done with him is actually following him on tour of this book tour. And we tell the story. So you see him signing these books and he's doing these, these book releases. But we actually tell the story of that moment where he almost gave everything up, that defining moment um, when he was sitting in a hotel bathroom because he had been homeless at the time, but he was also still doing comedy stand up at the same time, but he didn't have a place to wash up. So he would wash up in the bathroom. But this one specific day, there was a conference at this hotel and he didn't want anyone seeing him washing up in the bathroom, but he tried to wait it out, but men kept coming into the bathroom and he was frustrated. He was like, you know what? I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to live like this. But he, as he was crying and sitting on the toilet, he heard the voice of God that told him, look, if you just do one more show, I'll take you to places that you've never seen or even thought of being. And it was, I believe, the following week that after doing the show that he ended up getting the call to be the host of the Showtime at the Apollo. And so that is the premise of this book, Act Like a Success, Think Like a Success. And although you're seeing content of him doing this book tour, we tell that story in the background and and that's the project we ended up doing together. Now, I ended up working with C for multiple years after that, but um, that's one of the core projects we've done. Other projects include creating concept videos of certain shows that he wanted to create um, because he's got somewhat of a contract like Oprah has where she can create shows that don't have to involve her being in. And so we, we created concept shows based off of that. Storytelling is based still, but what that show. Mm -hmm. like. mm -hmm. All right. I want to dive into more your, this roadmap that you talked about and this really interesting branded approach that you have called dramatic demonstration of proof. And it covers again, just to remind listeners, these five steps of behind the scenes, social proof, live illustration, transformation, and unique mechanism, which I'm kind of fascinated about of what you mean by that. But before we do that, I want to take a quick break for our good friends over at Sendable. And when we come back, if you wouldn't mind just taking us through your process a little bit more so that our listeners can maybe start applying it immediately in their life. And what the heck, if they want to take it to a whole new level, they can call you after the show. That worked for you? That works. All right, Jude, be back right after this. Many of you have been following me and the business of story on social media for a while now, and I really appreciate it. And if you're not, I hope you will. We share valuable business storytelling tips to help your brand stand out among the awful noise out there. And we do it all thanks to Sendable, a social media management platform that helps over 3,000 digital agencies worldwide to work with their clients, breathe life into their brands, and get their stories heard on social media. 
What we like about Sendable is they make it super easy to manage your content and your stories online. They allow you to source content from clients and collaborate closely with them to create a social media strategy built on true and proven storytelling principles. You can reliably plan and schedule content to be automatically published to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and more. And you can demonstrate the impact that this content has had on your audience growth and conversion by reaching out through their in-depth reporting and analytics. There's much, much, much more that you can do. But you know what I think maybe my favorite feature has to be smart posts functionality. Now, what smart posts are is that makes it incredibly easy to craft social media content and in one step, one single step, customize it for each platform, giving you the best chance of driving engagement and getting people to pay attention to your content. Sendable truly makes managing so many channels an absolute breeze. I know, you have a lot of choices when it comes to social media management apps. So I wanted to let you know we here at The Business of Story can't recommend Sendable enough. Gavin and his team are so great that they have a special offer just for you. You can now get, as a special offer for Business of Story listeners, Sendable's traction plan for only 69 bucks a month. That's a 30% savings. So sign up now at sendable.com forward slash park 30. Believe me, your stories will take off. Hey, welcome back to the show. Park Howell here, and I am with video documentarian, storyteller extraordinary, Charles Jude. Thanks for being here. I'm really, really fascinated with your approach. I'm, you know what else I'm kind of fascinated about? Is like just your calm, measured demeanor. I mean, when I listen to you, I'm like, this dude's got it completely dialed in. This is working. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so... You've got this system, the, the Dramatic Demonstration of Proof, which I love that name. You go backstory, social proof, live illustration, transformation, unique mechanism. Can you walk us through it? Say, for instance, let's, okay, I'm going to be completely self-serving here. I've just hired you, say, and I would like for you to do a video piece about the work I do with Business of Story masterclasses, teaching leaders of purpose-driven brands how to really focus and clarify their stories so that they can make the impact in the world they want. And I'm telling you, I need probably maybe a three-minute demo, three-minute docu-demo video of me doing this. How do you approach that? Yeah, so I approach that by first starting with road mapping. I think you've given me some context and understanding why you want to use this, right? So I would Actually, I want to have some fun with this. Let's, let's, all right. I'm going to ask you some questions that would show how I would go about doing this. So you've mentioned to me you want to do a video that shows your workshop, right? Yeah, that's you know, but essentially to, make, to sell it, to make sure that people know it's available to them. Got it. So you want to be able to show what is happening in this workshop. Now, have you gotten pushback of you know, people on the fence not sure if this is the right thing to invest in? Of the calls I get on it, I would say 80% of them are like, no, I'm pretty sure this is what we want to do and we want to move forward. And much like your program, because I've got a story cycle system, a real system, you know, they're kind of bought in. Occasionally they will go, well, we're just kind of exploring this. Can you tell me more about it? But I'm guessing that's probably 20% of my calls. Got it. Okay. So what's the interest? What's the interest in wanting to do a video like this? For me, you mean? Yes. Or for the, yeah, uh, to let people know about the program and to really demonstrate the power of it. Got it. So to demonstrate the power of it, what is the power of it? The power of it is what I do with my um, attendees is, look, Jude, as you know, we are all storytelling monkeys. We are intuitive storytellers. It is what makes us uniquely human beings. It's literally what sep story separates us from chimpanzees, essentially, because we, like you had talked about, can imagine a future, create fiction around that future, and use that as an organizing force to bring people together to live into it and create something bigger. What I do with my workshops is turn people from intuitive storytellers into intentional ones. 
First demonstrating the power of story and then giving them proven narrative frameworks that they can use for everything from simple little two-sentence stories to a little bit bigger anecdotes, which are small stories that can create a big impact to something much larger that they can use for brand story strategy. Uh, and that's the story cycle system. So they can use that to outline presentations, long form communications, strategic planning, but it's all done from a story narrative mindset of taking your audience on a journey, giving them a story arc and taking them, moving them from the world they're in to the world they want to be. Got it. So, Park, you've told me a great deal about what this is, this workshop is. Now, I want you to tell me, who are you? Who, who is Park, and why is Park able to be the facilitator of this workshop? Well, I've always been fascinated by creativity and commerce. And what I mean by that is my mom and dad took me and my two younger brothers to this amazing show when we were little kids at the Fifth Avenue Theater in uh, Seattle, Washington. And we were sitting up near the front and it was George Cohen's Yankee Doodle Dandy, right? And in it was the star from the Partridge family. Um, oh, and now his name completely escapes me, but he was the lead in it. And I sat there absolutely mesmerized by the production, the music, the musicians, and so forth. And at that moment, I'm, I don't know, I was probably in the fifth or sixth grade, and I was playing the piano at the time and taking piano lessons. I knew at that moment that I wanted to explore something at the intersection of commerce, being business, and creativity. You know, like a producer mindset of like, what makes this thing work and what are all the details that go into that? So fast forward into my college days, I went in, I got a degree in communications, but I also got a degree, as many of you, our listeners know, in music composition and theory, because as a kid, I was always writing these little songs, you know, these little ditties, and I just loved to write music because I was fascinated by how it was built, how it was created, and how it worked. And so the music composition theory degree gave me an insight into what works and why it works. Now, fast forward 30 years, when I was pivoting away and I had my transformational moment where I was sitting on the edge of my bed, I'll never forget it, back in 2015 in September and said, I don't want to run my ad agency anymore. I'm not into this. I've done it for 20 years. I'm now growing into something bigger and better, something that really fans my curiosity as to why does creativity work in the world? And that was story. Because we were using it in our company, I was trying to figure out how does it work. When we really got the system figured out, it was having amazing impact for our clients. And people would say, well, why don't you just keep running the agency that way? And I said, I realized that I had to pivot away from the traditional approach to advertising and communications and really approach it from this whole new vision of being a story consultant, coach, and teacher. So I weirdly enough, bring my two worlds together of the communications that I studied in, in at school at WSU and my music composition and theory. And here I am now back at that intersection of creativity and commerce and how can you bring them together to really enact significant change. Storytelling and the study of it, the hero's journey, Blake Snyder's, you know, Save the Cat and the 15 Beats to Story and everything I've studied just simply reignited in me that interest in music composition theory, but now it's story composition and theory. And why does it work on our brain? Why does that, why is it so primal that it gets us homo sapiens excited and encouraged and passionate about something? And of course, then how can we use it for purpose-driven brands to, to move people forward? Love it. Love it. So you've got this dialed in. You have the advantage that you're a storytelling expert, so you have it dialed in. What I begin to do there is the first phase of, of road mapping, which is understanding who you are and understanding why you're doing this kind of work, right? So you've, you've taken me through that entire story in less than three to four minutes. What I'm also doing in that moment is I'm thinking of the visual references that I can now create to make a connection to this workshop. So you've already made that connection where music composition and communications, right, is a part of that connection and how it relates to composing music can relate to composing stories. Well, one of the dramatic demonstrations is called live illustration. And so this would take more time, but I would want to create 
a scene where we are connecting this moment of music and how a song is composed to how a story is composed. Lead that into now this workshop and tying it all together. But phase one is understanding who you are, listening to all the different stories to see how does this connect? How can we create something that is compelling, that's interesting, that takes what could seem mundane and make it exciting? How can we show who Park is, this music composition degree that he'd gotten back in college, how can we show how that, that moment in time can relate to this moment in time, can make it interesting? So phase one is, is understanding who you are, why you're doing what you're doing, what are your business goals? Phase two is that dramatic demonstration. I've listened to everything that you've told me. And then I, I start to map out, okay, here's where I see this story going for the workshop. and then. The final part is how do you market this in a way and leverage it in a way that you're not just posting this once online and saying, hey, this is who I am, but now you're able to leverage it over and over and over for years to come. I mentioned Keisha and I mentioned other projects that I've worked on. The beauty of these documentary pieces, these stories that we're telling, long form stories that we're telling is that they're able to now take this one story that was created in, in a moment and use it for years to come. I created the documentary series for Keisha in 2010, between 2010 and 2013. As recent as 2018, she, is still, she was still promoting that documentary series. And so that's a bit of the process is that we go through road mapping first to map it all out. Let's think through this whole entire thing from beginning to end before we ever turn on the camera. How and long I, does your road mapping process take? So it can take between four to eight hours. It depends on, um, I usually do a questionnaire in the beginning to figure out more about who you are and the, and the goals that you're looking to accomplish, but it can take, it's a full day. I ask for the client to give me a full day that's between four to eight hours to uh, take this time to sit down and talk. Cool. So then from that, you get a plan in place, you sit down in front of your client and share it with them so that they're on board and they can tweak it, whatever they like. And then is that when you move into production and in your production mindset, is that where you're working on and or working from that idea of the dramatic demonstration of proof? Yes. Yes. So we've done all this work in the beginning and, and now I have for myself this, this blueprint of understanding you at a very, very deep level. Cause now I've, I've dug so deep that once you get into the workshop and you're doing your thing, I don't even have to interrupt you because there I'm, I'm, I'm just there to be a fly on the wall. And I will begin to look at, okay, you know, Park told me about uh, something as simple as maybe he likes a certain brand of candy and that candy is, is helpful to the workshops, right? Or like the story that you told a story before about, um, I believe your mother's story and how a orange change the trajectory of her life. And let's say you decide to tell that story during one of your workshops. I would then know to capture that orange so that we can go back and add that to the story or go back and add that to the workshop video. So yeah, once I get, once we've done all that work in road mapping, then in the workshop, you know, I'm able to now craft that video, craft that story, looking at what we've already outlined to craft that story and then giving you the final products to make sure that you're able to market it and promote it. And when you're talking the workshop, is that a workshop you do with your customer, with your client? You mean now you're workshopping their documentary before you're shooting it? Sorry. I, yeah. So I meant the workshop as in your workshop. Your, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. That's what, yeah, I was, I was kind of toggling between both of those. Okay. And by the way, I remembered who starred in Yankee Doodle Dandy and it was David Cassidy. And at the Yankee time, Cassidy. big time fan of ours. Cause you know, we grew up you know, watching the Partridge family and he was right at the center of that. So that was, that was one of my big defining moments. So, all right. So now let's go in and talk about these five steps. If someone is trying to think about this dramatic demonstration of proof, number one, the first step is behind the scenes. So by that, do you mean you are just simply capturing behind the scenes background or are you establishing the backstory for this person? Yes. And let's, let's even, let's take it a step further than that. Let's, let's say I'm not even the one capturing it, right? Let's say, let's look at dramatic demonstration of proof as, as outside of just Jew Charles and, and what he's doing uh, it, behind the scenes is just taking your camera phone, right. And documenting everything. So let's say you're doing the masterclass and you know, you want to just be able to show that there's 20 people in the room, right. And you're now here doing this workshop. That's a piece of behind the scenes, right. It's showing what is happening, 
behind the scenes. But behind the scenes, again, I mentioned the story of story of uh, Starbucks being in Starbucks in that moment. When I'm there, I'm looking to capture things that shows you being human, which may be conversations, it may be, you know, other elements, but behind the scenes is all about connection and access. How do we give people access to something that they wouldn't normally have access to? And you can do that whether I'm recording or you can do that on your camera phone and just making sure to document it. And we could still use that in the story later on. Behind the scenes, another type of behind the scenes is like archival footage, right? Uh, it's, it's the picture of you going to that play with David Cassidy or you playing music in your music composition class. Those are behind the scenes moments as well that we can bring an audience into. Okay, so an example of this that just came to mind when you're talking about this National Geographic and they just like kill it online with their storytelling. They're just fantastic. And I was watching a video from there, one of their um, photographers a, a month or so ago, and they said one of the things that they started doing was just that, is getting to know the people behind the camera. So they did a bunch of behind the scenes storytelling on who are getting these photos and, and images and videos and how do they get them. And so they really personalize their overall brand that way, primarily focus on just exactly what you're talking about, that behind the scenes capture of what these people go through to make their images so amazing. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. So you were doing that and you're just, so this is a, the behind the scenes is just a strategic way of capturing all of this extra footage uh, that you will be using in the documentary down the road. Number two then would be social proof. What I, I know what social proof is, but what do you mean? How are you using it in this context? Yeah, so social proof is, is really interesting. Most people know what social proof is, meaning it's testimonials, it's, it's word of mouth, it's what do other people have to say about you. But what I'm also thinking about is the visual references of social proof. So things like seeing you stand in front of a room talking, things like seeing people laugh because you're giving a talk. Those elements of social proof is what I'm looking for, those moments where people are not just what they have to say about you, but how they're also interacting with you to show that you, that they actually like working with you to show that you are an authority figure. Those are different elements of social proof. I got you. So again, you're thinking about it from a documentarian standpoint. Yes. It's capturing these images and imagery that's demonstrating that social proof. So then the next one up is live illustration. Live illustration is all about using a type of analogy or, or, uh, yeah, an analogy is probably the best way to put that. How do you illustrate a point that you're making that may not involve people, that may not involve... So, for example, I'll give you a perfect example. I worked with an interior designer who mentioned in our interview that uh, construction or remodeling a house is just like, you know, putting puzzle pieces together. It's like one big puzzle. And so instead of just hearing him talk about that, I pushed him further to say, hey, let's actually purchase a puzzle and show as you're talking about, you know, construction or remodeling is like putting together a puzzle. We actually see you and your team putting together a puzzle. And so that's what live illustration is. Again, I'm thinking through the visual references of it because it's so important. I think what's, what's important is that we know that storytelling is powerful. It's persuasive. It allows you to connect. But there's something else that also allows you to connect that's important. And that is what we see with our own eyes. If we think about as young kids growing up, learning how to read or learning about different objects, we would match the word cat with the image of a cat. We would look at dog and match, you know, read dog on a, on a piece of paper and then see the image of a dog. And that's how we learn to communicate. We connected the dots of, okay, what this looks like is this word. And so that is exactly the same thing I'm doing here with dramatic demonstration of proof is I'm I'm taking these elements that we know in marketing, like behind the scenes, social proof. These aren't new elements that we've heard of, but are we showing people? We're telling them stories, but are we showing them the story as well? And so that's where, you know, I, I look at, okay, this guy has told me this is like a puzzle. Well, I can see a puzzle. So let's actually get one. Let's get a real puzzle of a house that you've actually completed so that we can now actually show people what you're talking about when, they, when you say this is like putting a puzzle together. So it goes back a little bit earlier when you were talking about my music composition theory and how it relates to story composition and theory. And you would show that where I might be at the piano playing something, showing here and, and, and then explaining 
you know, look at this is basically the same sort of concept of set a problem resolution that our ears love and that take us through a piece, you know, and resolve us, you know, on that final chord that you're trying to do with your storytelling. You know, set up, you take them somewhere else, you add conflict, contradiction, you know, you, you aggravate them a bit and then you resolve it all at the end. So you would be showing that visually in this live illustration standpoint. Yes, yes. And, and isn't that, doesn't that sound just a little bit more interesting when you connected it and we see you playing music and we've connected that point to what storytelling is like? Because now that, that, that ultimately becomes something that's ingrained in your mind, how music is related to storytelling. Yeah. Quick question before we move on to transformation. It sounds to me like there's not a whole lot of scripting going on in your productions. You're maybe outlining what you want to do and where you want to take the audience, but it sounds like you're picking a lot of this stuff up as it's happening. Yes, I am. Uh, So we start with the interviews. That's why I start with road mapping. It gives me a lot of information, but then I also, when we actually start production, start with the interviews as well. Filming the interviews first because the interviews, the dialogue is what shapes the narrative. And that's why I always say I'm crafting a story because the crafting comes from the interviews. The crafting comes from what the other person is saying, not what I think the story should be. It's, it's still on the entrepreneur, the brand that they've taken careful time to build. I want to make sure to show that truth and not just show and not just create something that I think would be powerful. I want to be able to create something that stands in their truth. So it starts is there isn't any scripting at all. What is, there's a lot of preparation. There's, work that I do to make sure I understand who this person is, what they're putting out into the world, what other people think about them. That's a big piece is I, I'm not just listening to what the entrepreneur is saying, but I'm connecting the dots as far as what other people have to say as well. And then again, we do the interviews and the interviews shape the documentary itself. Mm -hmm. This is where your curiosity comes back to play, isn't it? I mean, you as a producer or listeners out there, if you are going down this road trying to tell the stories on behalf of your clients, you really have to have this immense curiosity and patience to be able to sit down and listen. And then I guess underscored or overarching is empathy, is really hearing your customer, your client, the story that you're trying to tell so that it informs the story versus you and your assumptions informing the story. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what a story does, right? A story, you don't want to make it too obvious what the story is, right? You want to be able to allow people to come to their own conclusion of what the story is. What's the meaning behind the story? Um, you guide it, you influence it, but you want that person to have their own meaning as well. And so that's, it's the same thing with the work that I'm doing. I'm looking to stay true to the art form of storytelling, allowing the work that I present before you to allow you to come to your own conclusion about what this means to you. Gotcha. Okay. So we've collected footage from behind the scenes to really get a feel for who this person is, what they're about. You've got social proof and the visual references that you're shooting to demonstrate and show the concepts that they're trying to communicate so that your audience can watch and and experience that through the visual medium live illustration that plays right into live illustration. So you're demonstrating that in effect transformation. That's step number four. What's that about? Transformation on an elementary level is, is before and after. So I think we've seen this a lot in the fitness world where, you know, someone may be overweight and then we've seen they, they have lost a hundred pounds, right? That, that power of you seeing the before and after, but transformation is also in storytelling, it is the before and after what's happening in the beginning that leads this person on this journey, right? The inciting incident. And then what's the resolution? What happens at the end? And so in transformation, I'm looking to capture those moments where this person is being vulnerable and saying, this is how I feel. And this is the beginning of the story. They're saying, this is how I feel. And that feeling, again, may be something that can be portrayed visually, whether it is being portrayed through behind the scenes, a behind the scenes moment where they're having a conversation with someone that, you know, it's, it's just them two having a conversation. It's not even me interviewing them. And then of course that leads to the after what happens at the end. So I mentioned with Tracy Lynn, the doc six part documentary series I had done in the beginning of that documentary, she talks about being afraid to reinvent herself. And she talks about this inciting incident where in 2016, they made a change in their business, and she knew she had to make that change. 
But we relate that back to uh, she mentioned like it's like jumping out of an airplane, being as scared as jumping out of an airplane. She skydived. So we ended up using that video. So that's the before. And then the after, towards the end of this documentary series, she talks about the transformation that she has. And I don't want to give it away too much, but mm-hmm. that's what before and after is. It's, it's taking, making sure to take this person on a journey of showing them again. You're all, you're, this is all about show and tell, but show them that before. What were you looking like? What were you feeling like? What were you thinking? We, we do that before and then the after as well. And then that leads us to the fifth step of unique mechanism. Now tell me about that. Yeah, unique mechanism, there's a lot of different ways a unique mechanism can take place. So there's the mission is a unique unique mechanism. And then there may be, like for example, I've created dramatic demonstration of proof. That's a unique mechanism. And I want to show you two practical ways of what that looks like. The mission, I did a documentary for a gentleman named Ted Rubin. And Ted Rubin starts this story talking about his mission in life, which is no let up. And so no matter what he does in his life, no let up. But this goes into a story about a struggle that he had with keeping his daughters in his life. He went through a bad divorce and um, unfortunately his daughters returned against him. But he goes into telling the story of how no matter what, even when his daughters are pushing him away, he, he doesn't let up, right? But that's what makes him unique. That's what makes, he's a social media marketer and ultimately with the kind of work that he's doing, that's what makes him unique is because he has that mission to never let up. And that's his unique mechanism. That's what you're trying to convey through your documentary? Yes, yes. And so he starts by telling the story in the very beginning of this documentary. He tells the story of where this idea comes from. And the idea comes from a coach that he had when he was wrestling back in high school. Now, Ted Rubin is 60 years old, six zero years old now, but still works out as if he's a 16 year old. And so we show that um, in the beginning of this documentary. And that's a unique mechanism because again, it's what allows you to see who he is and why he is the way he is. Mm -hmm. And then obviously easily we've talked about dramatic demonstration of proof over and over here, but dramatic demonstration of proof is a methodology, a process, a system that you've created that we're not just talking about it, but how do you show what that process actually looks like? So, Something like that might be seeing me work behind the scenes and how I'm able to capture the things I'm able to capture. What does the roadmap actually look like? Those are different elements of the unique mechanism. So the unique mechanism of business of story then, I guess, is really my story cycle system because it's everything I do is first built off of that 10-step system. And as I learned it, then I found, you know, the five primal elements of a small story well told. And I found, you know, the three steps of the and, but, and therefore all break down in this act one, act two, act three, a set of problem resolution dynamic. But it first all started with me and the much bigger picture of the story cycle system. So I imagine that is my unique mechanism in your world. That is. So now that we've come to all five, what you realize is that all five of these are intertwined with each other. The unique mechanism of your story cycle, we may show a behind the scenes of how that got started. We may show social proof of other people using the story cycle. So, we, you know, this isn't something brand new that you just kind of came up with. This is something people are using in the real world. We may show the live illustration of what that story cycle looks like. So it's not just a PDF or a paper on a screen, but it's also like what are the specific 10 points that you have in the story cycle? What is, what is it that we can relate to? What's an analogy that this can relate to? Transformation, you talked about a little bit about how it's how it began and then now where it is now. And so you realize all five core elements of dramatic demonstration are tied together. What makes it dramatic is the story. The demonstration are the visuals. And then the proof is what are you looking to prove, right? Because ultimately people have objections before working with you. They're skeptical, especially now in 2020, where there's so much noise out there. Everyone's saying how great they are, but can you prove it to me? Can you prove to me beyond just saying we're great? Can you actually show me the different, you're telling me a story, but can you show me those stories of what makes you unique? Yeah. 
Wow, it sounds fantastic. I mean, I can't wait to, to put this together. One last question, because I know you're really busy, and I got to get my bones downtown Phoenix <laughs> before the, <laughs> the, the, the traffic hits. How long someone hires you to come in to help put together this documentary, be it one piece or a three-part series or whatever? How long is that process from the time they say you're hired to the time you deliver their first product? That time frame can take anywhere from 90 days to six months. So three months to six months. And that includes, you know, going through road mapping, actually producing the content and then delivering the content is, is at the very least 90 days. That gives me time to go deep enough and to really see how you work in different things like that. And then six months, depending on what we want to accomplish. Now, sometimes it can go over that as well. If we're creating a large documentary series, like a six part documentary series, but it's always customized towards the client and what they're looking to accomplish. Yeah. Great. Jude, where can people learn more about you and the really cool work you're doing in video documentary storytelling? Yeah. The best way to connect with me is through my website. It is judecharles.co. If you're looking to take your business to the next level, if you're looking to share your story and be able to build a deeper connection, that's what this is all really is about. It's about building a deeper connection with the people that want to work with you, with the people that want to be a part of your tribe. That is the best way to reach out to me, to connect with me and to get a better understanding of the work that would, we could possibly do together. Uh, fantastic. Well, thank you, man. I really appreciate you being on the show today. Fascinating work. And I'm, I'm eager to hear from you listeners out there. If you try some of the stuff or think about it, what do you think? Is it working for you? So let us know. But thanks for being here, man. Thank you for having me, Park. It, it truly, like I said at the beginning, it was an honor to uh, be on the show, a show that I listen to all the time. Ah, uh, that makes my heart a sing. I appreciate that. And, you know, thank you all for listening to this edition. If you like what you heard, share this episode with Jude, with friends and family or other people that you are trying to figure out their video production or how to go about telling and capturing their story. Because it seems to me this idea, this dramatic demonstration of proof is just, it's a wonderful concept for all of your brand storytelling. So share this episode with them, earmark it for yourself. And if you haven't been over to iTunes yet and given us a rating and review, Please do. I'm you know, moving into 2020 here. I would love to grow the listenership. Just to let you know, we are at around 25 to 30,000 downloads a month of our four shows, which puts us among the top 10% of listened to podcasts in the world. And I'm just really, really proud of that. That's why I show up here every week to bring really amazing story artists like Jude to you to help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. So uh, yeah, please share it with your world. Sendable, again, I wanna thank those folks for jumping on board and, and having faith in us and to let you know about their wonderful online storytelling platform. So jump over, go into sendable.com forward slash park 30 and you can get 30% off of their traction plan right now. I guarantee you the best money you will ever spend on helping to publish, produce, follow up, see how it's impacting your world online. And until next week, when we will be right back here again for you, I want you to remember, always remember, that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Jude just proved how strong that is starting as an eight-year-old, and you can see where he is today. Go for it. Story on, my friends.